Okay, <clears throat> I'd like to discuss briefly uh, how to approach the specific questions that you're going to face on the Regents exam. Uh, hopefully this is rather review for you or a little bit of, um, uh, you know, specifics, but you should already be basically familiar with this. Most important thing to realize is that when the essay portions of the exam are graded, they are graded by someone who is not your teacher. By state law, your teacher can't be the grader, which means you can't just sort of shorthand things or assume they know how you talk or assume they know how you put things. You also have to realize that we, um, the faculty, uh, have to read through all of these regions, and we have to do it relatively quickly. <clears throat> we were a little bit under time pressure. That means the easier you make it for us, the more helpful it is. What I mean by that is reading a well-organized essay that clearly hits all the points of the question is a lot easier to grade than if we have to go through it hunting to see if we can find how you are addressing this or that. So organization and clear writing is very helpful. I'll also give you some other tricks uh, along the way, um, not tricks, but pointers about how to, to do this most effectively. Finally, I remind you, we're actually on your side, even when we're grading. We're not sitting in judgment, hoping to find ways to take points away from you. What we want is to find reasons to give you a good grade. We really do. So the more you help us, the more you give us, um, the more you take the task seriously, the more we'll be able to do to find something that we can do with this. If you are faced with a question you know nothing about, and you leave it blank, it is a zero. It is no points. There is nothing we can do for you. If you at least make a try, take a stab at it, <laughs> even if you're a little panicked and you think you don't know anything, you put down what you do know. You try to, to, to figure something out. Well, maybe you're not going to get full credit, but we will find if under the rules the state gives us, and we adhere to them very strictly, we can find a reason to give you some points. On the exam, you will have, as you know, uh, 28 multiple choice questions. <coughs> Pardon me. These will be followed by two short essays. The essays will be, these short essays, will be based on pairs of documents. So they will give you something. Um, I'll, I'll just give you an idea. I'll show you this here. I'll pull one of these up for you. Hang on just a second. Okay, so they might give you something that looks a bit like this. Pull this over. Oops. And I'll pull this up. So here you've got document one, and they give you a, a little snippet here, and they tell you it's a, a telegram. They give you a date on it. And document two, they give you these uh, illustrations here. These are actually sort of posters. And again, they give you a source. Library of Congress, Prince and Photographs Division. Okay. And you have to look at them. So they give you these two, document one, document two, and this is for the first short essay question. <coughs> now, with those documents, you will have to write a short essay. Think in terms of two rich, thick paragraphs. Not a paragraph that's one sentence, but give us two good, thick paragraphs. Paragraph one is you're going to identify the historical context. Uh, what period, whoops, I should put this here. What period are these two um, documents about? What issue are they both about? What is going on at this time with respect to this issue? The more you tell the story into which these documents fit, the better you're going to do. 
use the source information given to you, usually at the bottom. <coughs> so in that, that um, example I just gave you, right, it tells you source, telegram of January 19, 1917. Well, it doesn't tell you much, right? But it does tell you 1917. And when you see that date, I'm hoping for all of you, that triggers a thought. That's World War I era, yeah? And a telegram, you should re remember, is a <coughs> written communication. It's the written down message from a telegraph message. So this is one person sending a message to another right around World War I. Even if you don't recognize right away what this is, probably won't, but in this you might, this document you might. Um, it gives you, all right, let's see, I'm dealing with World War I, let me make a note to that. And you think about the historical context into which this might fit. If you look at the two of them, whoops, you see this, and if you read it, uh, talks about American neutrality, talks about making war, and then you see this, this is about liberty bonds, uh-huh, victory, soldier, soldiers, parade, etc. Okay, so you put it together and you try to think, aha, uh -huh. this is, the context here is World War I. Both of these documents are relating during the World War I period clearly to the war. You read them through carefully and then try to figure out specifically what are these, yeah? So, uh, again, I'm hoping that for this, for instance, you see this document. It says, we intend to begin on the 1st of February unrestricted submarine warfare. We shall endeavor, that we'll try, in spite of this, to keep the USA neutral. We make Mexico a proposal of alliance. Make war together. Hmm make peace together, and Mexico will reconquer lost territory in Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona. You might recognize this document as the Zimmerman telegram, or the Zimmerman note, when Germany, trying to keep the United States out of World War I, said to Mexico, why don't you attack the U.S. from the south, uh -huh. and distract the U.S., and then we can... Um, you know, do our thing over in Europe. <clears throat> All right, so this has to do with the war. And then you notice this. This is two million reasons you buy Liberty Bonds. You might also remember that Liberty Bonds, bond is a loan that people make to the government. You buy a bond, you're loaning the government money, uh, and then the government will pay you back, you know, 25 years from now with interest. The Liberty Bonds, right, were all to fund the war. The U.S. was borrowing money from American citizens to fund the war. Okay, now you're thinking, aha, now I know a bit of the context here. So, you talk about that context. This is taking place during World War I, um, when uh, uh, the uh, Germans were engaged in unrestricted submarine warfare, and they were... Um, torpedoing United States vessels, even though we weren't in the war yet. This was causing Americans to get angry about it, and the Germans, fearing that they were going to, um, uh, that the United States was going to enter the war, reached out to Mexico. Once we, we entered the war, however, we needed money, and therefore we were borrowing from Americans and giving them a chance to support the effort. Um, the bonds were sold to everybody, uh, many of the people who stayed home and had sons or had husbands in the military, and it gave women and even sometimes kids, they could save up for these, these bonds, they were low denomination, many of them, made them feel like they had a part in the war. Now, what have you just done if you write all that? You've given historical context, you've shown the reader that you know what these are about, and how they both are about the same thing, the same item. You cleverly figured it out by using the source information, and very important, 
you have used outside information. You've made reference to things that are not in the documents that you couldn't have known simply from reading the documents. That's what that outside information is. Yeah? So you've made reference to that. That's your first paragraph. Your second paragraph for this essay, you will have to specifically name the relationship between these documents. So they give you the two documents, and then they will say, in a short paragraph, a short two or three paragraphs, describe the context, then identify and explain the relationship between the events or ideas found. Cause and effect, similarity or difference, turning point. So, cause and effect, similarity or difference, turning point. I have them in a different order here. Well, I'll put them in the, their order. Why not? See, you're watching. This all happened live. Cause and effect. One document represents uh, an action, an event, a <coughs> choice, something that resulted in the second document, what the second document is showing. Turning point. They represent a major change that is taking place in U.S. history, in ideas, a cultural shift, change in attitudes, etc. So uh, before these, this document is showing the before and after, if you think, of some important event that changed the way Americans lived or worked. Yeah? And third is similarity or difference. Two events or groups that either are similar, though perhaps from different time periods, or different attitudes, reactions to the same event or issue. So, you must pick one of these. I put that in. You must pick one of these. Whammo. Bingo, bango, bungo. And you must explain. You must <coughs> explain your evidence for this. So you can't just say it's a it's similarity or it's turning point. You have to then talk about why it, it is that. What specific examples from these documents, not just general statement, this causes that because this first this happened or something like that. No. For instance, find a reference in the second document to something mentioned in the first. You must use outside information in order to get <coughs> um, full credit for this. So you're going to be graded on this essay out of five points. And I'll talk about why that's so important a bit later. So in this particular example that I've been using with you, we look at this and we say, well, what's the relationship? And you could make a case for a few things. I think the best case here is cause and effect. You need to bring the outside information knowing that the Zimmerman telegram, this attempt by the Germans to get the Mexicans to attack the U.S. and distract us, was the trigger after all that unrestricted submarine warfare, that was the thing that pushed us over the top and made the United States say, that's it, we need to go to war. If the Germans are going to pull this stuff, we have to go to war. So that's the cause of us entering the war. The effect was that we entered the war. And then, in the specific instance, we needed money 
and very quickly <coughs> to pay for all the equipment, to pay for the salaries of the, the men we were drafting. And so America had to go out and borrow from its own people vast amounts of money in these liberty loans, they were called, right? Or liberty, the liberty bonds they were selling in order to make this happen. So you've got to talk about why it is cause and effect. What is that relationship there? You can't just say it. If you do that, you are uh, up for a full five points. I just point out to you, and I put into this document here, I'll talk about this in a minute, cause of turning point and effect. Cause and effect, something that contributes to the occurrence of an event, rise of an idea, brings about a development. The effect is what happens as a consequence, the result, the impact, the outcome. The response will need to identify and explain cause and effect using evidence from both documents 1 and 2. The, evidence, uh, the explanation should make clear what the cause is and what the effect is. In most cause-effect questions, one document is the cause, the other is the effect. However, they're not going to tell you what it is. You have to read the documents and figure, ah, this is a causation question. Or you might figure out it's a turning point. Turning point is a major event, an idea, or historical development that brings about change. The response that you write will have to identify the turning point that the two documents are talking about and explain why it is a turning point. What's changing? What's the turn? And again, you've got to use both documents. Finally, comparison. Similarity or difference? How are they alike or how are they not alike? And once again, as I said, it could be two different responses to the same event. Like uh, a, a, you, that could be a letter about how we really need to go and beat the Germans and another letter from a guy saying all war is bad and we shouldn't be getting involved in war. All right, that's a difference. Or it could be um, the Zimmerman note watch this, and the Pearl Harbor bombing that started World War II. And you could point out they are similar, and they are both incidents that made it necessary for the U.S. to go to war and changed people's mind from being against involvement in the war to being in favor of involvement. So that would be a comparison, a, a similarity. Uh, this bit of document up here, I give you, you can... Pull that down as a PDF if it's helpful for you. Okay. <clears throat> you will then have to write a second essay. Short essay number two. You'll be given two new documents. Not the docs from question one. So you can't just reuse them. And they won't, be, they won't have anything to do with each other. You will then have to write a short essay. Again, think in terms of two rich, thick paragraphs. In paragraph one, identify the historical context again. What, are the, what is the period of these things? What period are these? There we go. Yes, I'm losing my mind. What period are these? Um, What period are these documents about? What issue are they both about? <clears throat> What's going on at this time with respect to the issue? The more you tell the story into which the documents fit, the better you will do. Paragraph two, this time, different. The regents will pick one of the two documents. They will say, after you do this, with respect to document number two, you must evaluate how reliable that document the one they choose, not the one you want, is as a source of information. Specifically name one of the following to discuss. You pick. So you have to think about the audience. For whom is this document written? How does that affect its reliability? Or purpose? Why was this document written? What is it trying to accomplish? How does that affect its reliability? Or the point of view 
of the author maker. What is the opinion of the author? Or what we call bias, which is to say, how one-sided is this document? What facts or counter-arguments are left out? You must pick one of these and explain your evidence for this. You must use a specific example from the document. This anti-slavery document was written for abolitionists. No, you must find something in the document um, about who the intended audiences make specific reference to it. Um, you must evaluate. So you can't just say it is, isn't reliable. You have to make a case as to why it is more or less reliable. You must use outside information to get full credit. Do not think of reliability as a yes-no question or an is-isn't question. It is, it isn't. Think of it as a more or less, to a greater or lesser degree. Look at, this, uh, look at it as a scale, like this one. Where does this document sit on the scale, and why? So is it somewhat reliable, more reliable than not, less reliable? When you're talking about the reliability of a source, I give you this, um, this helpful paper as well, and there's a copy of it you can download. Use this chart. You're not going to be able to have this chart at the regions, but you can use it to practice. Audience refers to the group for whom the document is produced. Who's supposed to read this? Why does this work exist? Who was the author thinking would receive this work? Does the author of the work indicate who the intended audience is? Point of view. What opinions does the author himself or herself have that's coloring the document? Are their opinions balanced and supported by facts, or are they just saying it? Are the opinions one-sided, poorly supported, or include just their strong personal beliefs? Bias talks about one-sidedness. What opinions are being given in the document? What facts are skewed? Skewed means sort of twisted. What facts are being left out? Or what facts are being intentionally included, being chosen to put in there to sort of emphasize them? Is the opposite opinion being shown at all? Or is it being, you know, are they admitting that, you know, the other guy has a point, but I have a stronger one, or are they just ignoring it? <coughs> and then finally, the purpose of the document. Why was the document produced at all? You think about how that affects credibility. If I'm producing it in order to get a, an angry reaction out of you, that's different from reporting a fact. If I'm cr creating a, a poster to recruit soldiers, that's different from a, a, an official report about a battle and here's how many guns we had and here's how many guys we lost. So why did the author create this document, and what's the goal, and how does that affect credibility? So again, if we look at our uh, example, we have another one here. So this is document two, or this document set two on this little, uh, um, you know, practice thing I'm giving you here. Let me pull this up just a bit so it's easier to read maybe for you. So once again, you've got two documents here. Document one for this second set is uh, nearing the conclusion of World War I, Woodrow Wilson, present, set out principles for peace that he shared before Congress, translating many domestic ideas into foreign policy. He shared the following with Congress. And it says, Woodrow Wilson, 14 points speech to Congress, 1918. And it gives you a bit of a speech. We entered this war because of violations of right had occurred, which touched us to the quick and made the life of our own people impossible, unless they were corrected. 
and the world secure once for all against their recurrence. What we demand in this war, therefore, is nothing peculiar to ourselves. It is that the world be made fit and safe to live in, and particularly that it be made safe for every peace-loving nation, which, like our own, wishes to live its own life, determine its own institutions, be assured of justice and fair dealing by the other peoples of the world. All the peoples of the world are, in effect, partners in this interest. And for our own part, we see very clearly that unless justice be done to others, it will not be done to us. Okay, so we think about this. This is Woodrow Wilson talking to Congress. Why would he be talking to Congress? Well, he wants to convince Congress to go along with some ideas he has. So he's laying out his ideas, and he says, we fought this war because of violations of right, because of injustices. And now we want to build a world that's peaceful, but also just and fair. That's what he's saying here. And we see uh, 1918, January 1918, it's during the war, but he's thinking about what's going to come after. Okay. Then we look at the second document. Uh, in 1931, a dispute near the Chinese city of Mukden, so it's a city in China, uh, precipitated events that led to the Chinese conquest of Manchuria. To precipitate something means to cause it to happen. In chemistry, you guys took chemistry, to precipitate something out of a solution is to make it solidify and fall to the bottom as sort of a powder, right? So it makes it sort of come out. So this dispute over this Chinese city triggered the Japanese to go in and conquer Manchuria, which is northern China. 1931, this is before we think of World War I, right? In response, U.S. Secretary of State Henry Stimson issued what would become known as the Stimson Doctrine, stating that the United States would not recognize any agreements between the Japanese and Chinese that limited free commercial intercourse in the region. So they're telling you what this is. The U.S., looking at this war between China and Japan, said, we will not allow, we will not be happy with any agreement you two make that limits the freedom of business to others, meaning us, in the Chinese-Japanese region. So whatever you do, we, we're not going to be shut out of it. So we just look at it here. Um, the American government deems it to be its duty to notify both the imperial Japanese government and the government of the Chinese Republic that it cannot admit the legality of any situation de facto, nor does it intend to recognize any treaty entered into between these governments which may impair the treaty rights of the United States or its citizens in China. or the international policy, commonly known as the open-door policy. We remember this, where the United States wanted to be able to trade freely with China along with everybody else. Now, we think about the relationship between these two documents. The question of the relationship here is not the one you're being asked. Aha. So don't think about the relationship, really, except to think about the context. Here, the United States is talking about making the world more just, more safe, and we are giving our ideas that are going to become our contribution, you should know outside information, to the Treaty of Versailles. This building of a world full of justice and fairness is why Woodrow Wilson is talking about getting involved with creating a League of Nations, which ultimately the U.S. never joins. So it's U.S. involvement in world affairs. <coughs> Here, the second one is a little bit later, 1930s, and once again, the United States wants the freedom to trade with China, but is saying to two other countries, the United States is trying to tell you 
how you should have your international agreements. So that isolationism that we think about so much, the United States is, is sort of coming out into the world as a world power. Okay, interesting, right? So the historical context for these two, I would say, if I were writing it, the historical context I would talk about is the United States emerging as a world power in the World War I and post-World War I period, where we are getting involved in international agreements, where we are about outside information to influence the Treaty of Versailles, where we have long been trying to get a fair deal in the, um, uh, in the Chinese market, which is what the open door policy was. Well, open door policy is mentioned, but it's not really explained. So if I were grading this, I would accept an explanation of the open door policy as outside information. Okay, so there's a bit of context. Now the next question, be careful, is now write your essay. What's the essay going to be? Describe the historical context. We just did that. Analyze document two and explain how audience or purpose or bias or point of view ex uh, uh, affects its reliability. Okay. So let's pull it up. First of all, therefore, when you talk about it, you can't really talk about number one. If you talk about number one, no credit, because the question asks about number two. Now we think about reliability. How reliable is this document? Well, what is it talking about? The American government deems it to its duty to notify the Imperial Japanese government that it cannot admit the legality of any situation, nor does it intend to recognize any agreement entered into those governments which may impair the treaty rights of the United States or its citizens in China, including those that relate to the sovereignty, independence, or territorial administrative integrity of the Republic of China, or to the international policy relative to China, commonly known as the Open Door Policy. Now you think for a minute, what's the issue of, of reliability here? What is it a source of information for? That's the first thing you have to decide. So let's make a note of this, by the way. When you're analyzing, first, what exactly is the information in the document that you are getting? Is this document likely accurate for that information? That's what you're really trying to figure out. So the first thing is to figure out, well, what the hell is it I'm learning from this document? This doesn't really tell us who's right or wrong in this Japan-China war. So you can't think about, well, you know, does, is, it, is it telling us China's better, but it's not really giving us a counter-argument information. What is it telling us? And if you think for a moment, it's telling us what the U.S. policy is. The point of this document, <coughs> it is created, first of all, who's the audience? The audience is the government of Japan and the government of China. That's who's meant to read this. And the author of it is the Secretary of State, whose job is to run American foreign policy. Is he a reliable source of information on what United States foreign policy is? Well, I'd say so. And if he is giving it to an audience who is intended to be influenced by that policy, he's probably being accurate in describing what our policy is. So if you talk about it from an audience standpoint, because this is an official document, 
one meant to be public so other people could read it and they could call it out if it wasn't true because it is meant for another government to make important decisions on and we want them to be influenced by our policy it's probably a reasonable statement of what our policy is so the audience is telling us it is the purpose of it is to be the official public statement of u.s policy well by making it an official public statement you're setting that policy so it's probably a pretty reliable document for what that policy is yeah the um, uh, point of view is there a point of view in here well I think you could talk about point of view and bias if you wanted to this way Stimson is assuming that Japan and China are thinking about getting into a treaty that might interfere with US rights so the question would be you could say if we take this as information that the Ch that Japan and China are tr about to get into a treaty that would impair US rights if you take this as that is Stimson a reliable source of information for that He has a bias, doesn't he? He's not explaining their version of events. He's not acknowledging that they've either said they will or they won't. And his point of view is first to concern himself, and he has to be a little bit paranoid to be protective of the United States. So you could say that affects his credibility. I would say you could make an interesting point if we take this as a source of information not for what the Japanese and Chinese were actually doing but what we were afraid they were going to do this is a source of information for how Americans think so it's not just a source of information for here's an official policy you could also read between the lines and say What's America's biggest concern over in um, Japan and China? It's not who's right or wrong. It's not who has the better case. It's not the good of the people of China or um, whether Japan is being unfair. Our only concern is, are we getting screwed in this somehow? And it does tell us that that is how Americans are thinking. So you can take it as a source of information on American attitudes towards this war. In which case, again, it's certainly accurate uh, for how Henry Stimson was thinking. And given the fact he was Secretary of State, it probably implies that it was President Herbert Hoover's um, thinking on this as well and the official, the official ideas running around the U.S. government. So we see how sophisticated you can actually get in answering this question. Okay. Now, quickly. When the reader grades your essay, here is the criteria. They're going to grade it out of five. Each of them is graded out of five. You get five points if you thoroughly develop both aspects of the task by discussing the historical context surrounding the documents and thoroughly discussing for set one the relationship <coughs> between um, the events and ideas found in them because that's the one is a turning point is a causation so thoroughly explaining not just saying but explaining for set two explaining not just saying but explaining how audience or purpose or bias or point of view affects the use of the selected document as a reliable source so the more fully you answer those the better you are you get five points if you're more analytical than descriptive you analyze and evaluate not just describe 
you integrate outside information and you support the theme with many relevant facts and examples from the documents. You get a four, four points, if you develop both tasks in depth, but do it a little bit less evenly and a little bit less thoroughly than you do in five. But you still have to do everything else. If you um, develop both aspects of the task in some depth, it's more describing than analytical. You include some relevant outside information, and maybe you make a mistake or two in it, some minor, you know, inaccuracies. Then you're talking about a three. Two, you really do kind of a not-so-hot job. One, you, you're, you're really just barely talking about what you need to talk about, and if you leave it blank, it's a zero. Remember, each is worth five full points. That's ten points total. Understand how the Regents is graded. There are 28 multiple-choice questions, plus six very short questions on the DBQ documents. I'll talk about those in another lecture, plus these two five-pointers. That's 44 points in the first part of the exam before the big DBQ essay. Ten points of that 44 is almost a full quarter. If you can get full credit for these, plus do well uh, with the very short DBQ document questions, that again, we'll see, you're probably not only comfortably passing, but you're a good chunk of the way to a high score. The DBQ Big Essay is scored separately. We'll get to that. So hopefully this was helpful for you, and the examples we talked about were helpful for you.